thought that I would take you for granted. As the deer pens for the water bowl, I thus feel, I thus feel, Jesus. My whole heart, I seek you, Lord. Be my everything. I have tasted and I have seen the Lord is good. So who now shall I turn to? Good morning, church. I welcome everyone back to Calvary Community Chapel this morning. It's uh, good to be here amongst my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Merry Christmas to you all. And uh, just for our announcements uh, this morning, there is no snack or meal downstairs after church today. Uh, we're all going to split out of here and go to be with family and do what we do. <laughs> so uh, next is um, as we begin our the new year next sunday of course the new year's day um will also be communion sunday so just keep that in mind and lastly um thursday evening remember we will have prayer night here at seven o'clock lord willing uh for corporate prayer so that's all the announcements i have please stand for the reading of the word and silence your phone if you haven't already and let's read the word today is first peter chapter 3 verses 21 and 22 and chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Beginning with verse 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, Father, we are blessed to be able to be in your presence this morning. And we are blessed that your presence lives, as, is, lives in us through your spirit, Lord. And we thank you and praise you for the Holy Spirit, for your presence around us and in us. Father, today is a, a day of symbolism of your, your birth. And Father, because of your birth... There was a life, and because of a life, there was a death, and because of a death, a resurrection. So, Father, we are thankful for the birth of Jesus Christ, who came into this world and gave himself for us. And because of that, Lord, we can celebrate eternal life and forgiveness of sins, God. But, Lord, now we thank you for this time to come and hear your word that you can transform us and give us understanding and we can learn from you and you gain wisdom and understanding of the word because you said that your Holy Spirit gives us understanding. And Father, we pray that you will be honored and glorified in our worship to you and our singing to you. We thank you for our families, for the blessing of our pastor and his family, 
And Father, I pray your blessing be upon him and upon your the word today as it comes from his mouth, Lord, from his heart. Father, uh, we just thank you so much for all that you give us and that you would be with us throughout this time and through this season. Help us to be mindful always that uh, it's, it's our life is about Jesus Christ and about our salvation and eternal life. And help us, Lord, to, to be better equipped today to share you with others. Father, we pray for those who are suffering and hurting and dealing with sickness and, and all kinds of things going on in their live, lives and, and ask God that you would bless them and help them and heal them, Father. In Jesus' name I pray and thank you, Lord. Amen.
description to marvelous for words to wonderful for comprehension like nothing ever seen or heard who can grasp your infinite wisdom who can fathom the depth of
Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of your Son. We love you. We praise you. You you have all of our praise, Lord. We hold nothing back and we give none to anyone else. It's all for you. We love you. We praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Hey, Merry Christmas. Yeah. Hmm. I know everyone has big plans today. We're going to be running the roads. We're going to be busy, busy. But let's try to leave all that for after service at the door. We want to give our full attention. The roads aren't going anywhere. They'll be right there waiting for us. 
Now, we're finally coming to a close on chapter 3 of 1 Peter. It's not going to be a Christmas message today, but there's a message about Christ nonetheless. So, 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 21. It's funny the variety of content that we've covered in this chapter. And it, it, there's a pattern to it all. It's not random. If read in succession, we won't reread the entire chapter, but remembering that in chapter 2, we started with the instruction for submission to masters and governments, and then glancing over chapter 3, you saw the instruction for wives to husbands, husbands to wives, and the call for heavenly conduct amongst brethren and all men, not returning evil for evil, but blessing. Bless others, even when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, even when you suffer wrongfully, because that's what Jesus did. He was wrongfully put to death in the flesh, but what? Made alive in the spirit. And what was the result? Victory, salvation. And last week we were given an image of that salvation in verse 20. But we examined verse 20 through the lens of the victory message. How it related to the endured suffering of the church leading up to salvation. So now in verse 21, the first words are corresponding to that. So we have to look back at verse 20, but in the context of today's verse. So we were looking forward last week, now we're looking backwards this week. So let's read our text for the day, and then we'll pray. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Let's pray. Lord, what weighty words we are going to divide today. We look to you for help. Ask for a special pouring out of understanding by your Spirit today, Lord. For everyone who is faithful to show up, bless them with grand revelation, deeper knowledge, Lord, of you and of your word. Let it go forth in power. Let me not hinder it, Lord. Let it be all of you, none of me. We want receiving hearts and renewed minds by your spirit, by your word, Lord. We commit the time. We yield to you and we are at your feet. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's dive in. Verse 21. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Corresponding is a thing formed after some pattern, resembling another, its counterpart. So let's look at the pattern Peter is describing. Let's jump back into verse 20, speaking about the spirits in prison that Jesus proclaimed victory over. Verse 20. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Now, Genesis 6, verses 5 through 9, will give us our expanded, expanded setting. So if you all would turn, hold your place and turn to Genesis 6. It's always to the left. 
Genesis 6, we'll start in verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Let's stop there. Now, the result of the world, mankind being in this condition, and Noah finding favor with God is in verses 17 and 18, the results of it. Behold, I am, I, even I am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. All right. We have an abbreviated version given to us in 1 Peter 3.20. But the model or the pattern that we're corresponding to is man is wicked. God sends forth judgment, the flood. Noah found favor with the Lord. God established his covenant with Noah, and he entered the ark. That's the pattern. Now, just looking at this pattern, immediately we can conclude two major things that will help us move forward. The first thing, God's judgment was to destroy the earth, all flesh, with water. And secondly, Noah was saved from that judgment by the ark. So we have our more specific pattern referenced in in 20 with our two major components, judgment and salvation. So you can flip back to 1 Peter, verse 21. Corresponding to that, to what? The second half of verse 20. In the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. It's not that they were saved by water, but that they were saved through water. Water was not the Savior in this pattern, but the judgment. The ark, or Jesus, was the Savior that brought them through. The ark is a picture of Jesus, the only way of salvation when the flood or judgment came. Only those found inside the ark or Jesus were saved. The water was not the means of salvation. All who were in the water died. The ark took the brunt of the storm. Water from all sides keeping all its occupants safe and dry from the judgment of God, bringing the believing passengers safely through the water into renewed creation. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Baptism of the the submersion. Now we are in fact saved by baptism. It's just not ours. That happens in water. But the baptism Christ underwent 2,000 years ago at Calvary. Jesus told us this in Luke 12, 50. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. This is what the psalmist meant in Psalm 42, 7. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. 
Jesus took every drop of wrath of judgment poured out by God, and he drowned in it. Just as Noah and his family had to enter the ark to be saved, we must commit our lives to Jesus, to the Lord, as our only Savior. When we do this, we become identified with his death, burial, and resurrection. Romans 6, 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The believer needs to understand the weight of claiming to die with Christ, especially when we're told it's being equated to the flooding of the earth. To just line up and get dunked real quick doesn't take much consideration. When the occupants were sealed into the ark by God, they weren't ignorant of the death that was occurring outside. Hebrews 11.7 By faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared the ark for salvation of his household, by which he com- condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, righteousness which is according to faith. So although that they remained safe from the storm, they revered what came. As the animals began to bed down from, for the first storm in the history of the world, they'd never heard thunder before. They probably heard screaming and beating on the outside of the ark to open up and let them in. There was a great, awareness and understanding of the death that was taking place. Jesus was very aware of the whips on his back and the nails in his hands. The Christian needs to be just as aware the old man is dead. He has been crucified with Christ. Christ's baptism into death is pictured in the believer's water baptism that we died with him. We express outwardly of what has taken place on the inside spiritually. Much like the flesh that was put to death by the flooding water, in the days of Noah, our flesh was put to death with Christ on Calvary. Our water baptism says that. It doesn't do that. It was as circumcision was of the Old Covenant, an outward expression. It has no power in itself. The act is a declaration of possession. It was like driving an awl through the ear of the bondservant. The old life is gone, and now this man belongs to God. As the believer is submerged, They acknowledge that the old man has died and been buried with him. And as they come up out of the water, they acknowledge being risen with him and wanting to walk in the newness of life. So the antitype or the corresponding baptism that saves us is Christ's death, which our water baptism represents. Christ's baptism saves us not our own, so much so that Peter felt the need to immediately qualify his statement. It's as if he had a full stop. He goes, right there, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. How is dirt removed from the flesh? By water. Being washed with water doesn't save you. It's so simple. A five-year-old can grasp it. But so many denominations, they're hung up. They can't seem to grasp it. Peter specifically painted us a portrait of salvation with Noah, where water clearly did not save the world. It destroyed it. This also doesn't mean that salvation requires faith plus baptism. Because Christ died, Christ cried out, Teltelestine, which It is finished. 
not, you're almost there. Go get baptized. This also explains why Jesus didn't baptize anyone. When he cried out, it is finished. The work Jesus did for salvation was complete apart from baptism. If baptism was required for salvation, it's odd that the Apostle Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 1.14, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius. If baptism resulted in salvation, we should kidnap all of our relatives and just dunk them real quick. That's silly, but that's no different than pedo baptism what the clergy does with infants or someone choosing to be baptized who doesn't really believe, who they're not, who they're not really saved. It's a false declaration apart from understanding. Acts 10, through 48 gives us evidence of Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit before undergoing water baptism. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So saved prior to baptism. And of course, we have the example of salvation apart from baptism. We have the example of the thief on the cross who was absolutely not baptized. And yet Jesus told him, Assuredly, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. It's similar to when James tells us that we're justified by works, that faith without works is dead. Our works don't save us, but they're a sign that we're saved. Baptism doesn't save us, but it's a sign unto others. It's not the works, it's not the baptism, it's what's behind them, faith. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Let's look at the next part of our pattern. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. The New King James says, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Believers of the new covenant find grace in the eyes of the Lord when they appeal or they pledge or answer to God for a good conscience. Conscience is the soul morally distinguishing between good and bad. A pledge is made For a good conscience, I want to do good and shun evil. In Luke 18, a blind beggar shouts out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. In Matthew 8, Behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Here is the one act man is responsible for in salvation. It's an appeal to God. Answer, confess your belief. For an appeal to God to be made for a good conscience, they have to desire one, and they have to believe that God can give them one. 
false converts don't desire salvation. Not like a blind man desires sight or a leper to be clean. They, they must truly, truly desire it. It must be real. The pledge, this appeal, this answer to God is understanding the condition and desiring and believing that God is able to make you new. When a blind man was made to see or a leper was cleansed, it wasn't a sign of anything that they did, but what God did. Baptism is a sign of what God did in our response. In Acts 8, when the Ethiopian eunuch asked Peter, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Peter replied, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He answered. He pledged. This is why probably when you were baptized, you were asked the question or you proclaimed that Jesus is your Savior. You answered. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This pledge of a good conscience is possible with the rest of verse 21. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because it was the Father who raised Jesus, as Galatians 1.1 tells us, we know that the life and death was accepted. And it's on the basis of his resurrection and by the power of the Holy Spirit that we live our new lives. Hebrews 9.9 9 tells us, Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. Services rendered by carnal means, washings, food, regulations for the body, they don't cleanse the conscience. And this would include the washing that takes place during baptism. It doesn't cleanse the conscience. But, Hebrews 9.14, How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Back to the baptism of Jesus. He was resurrected, raised up in newness of life. And that alive in the spirit, not hindered by the flesh, the conscience we have available to us, we have the mind of Christ through his resurrection, his new life. Verse 22 tells us what that victorious new life looks like. Verse 22. Who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him? Jesus has ascended into heaven from where he originally came. He's there today, not as the invisible, intangible spirit being, but as the living God-man in his glorified flesh. He has come into the fullness of the prophecy of Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make enemies a footstool for your feet. The right hand is a place of power, and Jesus is referenced in this position all over the New Testament, being seated, interceding for us, holding preeminence at the right hand of the heavenlies. Angels, authorities, and powers suggest a universal subjection that came with Christ's ascension. The heiress passive participle has been subject to him, stands emphatically forward and stresses actual subjection to Christ. It's not poetic. 
It's not metaphorical. It's not yet to come. It's here. It's now. It's forever. And it's for everyone. R.C. Sproul said there's not a maverick molecule in the universe. Now his enemies have yet to be made a footstool, but universal power is subject to him. Ephesians 1.20 When he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Here's the best part. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're seated with him. The Father sits Jesus at his right hand in place of honor and power, and we're seated with him. Before his face, he's ever beholding us in all of our afflictions. And that's how the Christian is to live. We aren't cringing around every corner, flinching at vain threats. Everything is subject to our omnipresent brother king. Philip de Corsi told a story of this timid new uh, medical doctor. He was a new resident. It was his first day, and he was so scared. He, he couldn't do anything. He didn't have any confidence to do work. Well, the head doctor had to come and talk to him, and he said, Jeremy, the worst thing that could happen today is one of your patient's code. And he said, and if that happens, the entire hospital is going to rush in here and help you. The Christian should have confidence to walk in obedience to their good conscience and not being fearful about the consequences that may come. Because the worst case scenario is that all of heaven will come to your aid. At the word of Christ, he will dispatch 12 legions of angels. All power and all authority is subject to his word. The Christian can boldly obey regardless of uncertainty of outcome. Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. God's in control. Christ's sovereignty over all spiritual forces is precious assurance to an afflicted believer. That whatever attacks may befall us, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it as well. It's because it's coming through the cracks of the filtering fingers of Jesus. He permits everything. And what befalls us is never the wrath of God. Because Jesus drank that cup dry. He drained it and we're seated with him, safe and dry Over the flood of judgment for the world, we're seated with Christ, safe in the heavenlies. Hallelujah. Now, we get to dip our toes into chapter 4. We've been in 3 for a while. Let's read verses 1 and 2 together. Therefore, Since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Now, we just thoroughly looked at the therefore. We just went over it. It's naturally flowing out of verses 18 and 22, 18 through 22, Christ's sufferings and our own. Since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. 
Peter covered the suffering that takes place for righteousness sake, both Christ's and our own. Hebert points out, but here his emphasis shifts to the related theme of willingness to suffer in order to avoid sinning. A life of Christian holiness is a happy life, but it is very costly. For victory and suffering, Peter set forth the need to be equipped with the proper attitude toward it. Christ is our example, our supreme example, in that he pursued the will of God, knowing fully of the suffering that was ahead of him. In the flesh, it's primarily speaking to his crucifixion, but it's also his entire experience here on earth. So it would include the endured mocking, anxiety, the hunger pains, all of it. Maybe we will suffer in the flesh for righteousness sake. Generally, overall, we will. But as far as a one to one ratio, there, there is uncertainty. Maybe I'll lose my job if I give this person the gospel. To arm oneself with the same purpose and attitude of Christ is if you knew for a fact you would lose your job and you gave the gospel anyway. Not hesitantly, not cringingly, but joyfully and boldly, and then you joyfully accepted the outcome. To arm ourselves with the same mind of Christ in regard to suffering in the flesh is to consider the loss that will be incurred and say onward, regardless of the amount. For Jesus, it was everything. And when we come to Jesus, we pledge everything. Our life gets put on the altar. We need to make ready in our minds for that offering to get collected. Matthew 10, 38, Jesus said, He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Be ready to die to self. And if you're waiting on the Lord, wait with cross in hand. The thing that I want most when I stumble, when I drop the ball before the Lord, is another opportunity. I want to be back in the fight. God is more concerned about focusing on your state of preparedness than being stressed and keeping your eyes downrange about what's to come. If you spend time arming yourself, making your mind ready for battle, you will be ready for battle when it comes. Peter told us this back in chapter 1, prepare your minds for action. The action here is suffer in the flesh. In the rest of our verse, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. All men suffer in the flesh one way or another. But for the believer, the qualifier is the willingness to suffer for righteousness sake. That man has ceased from sin. That man is willing to suffer any and all things for the sake of Christ. He's willing to suffer in the dark before no man, but before God alone. He's willing to suffer loss that no one else can count, but he'll feel the effects of. To his own shame, his own hurt, his own torment, he would rather suffer than sin. The Christian has a truceless war with sin. No matter what loss they incur, they will not bend the knee. They will not yield to sin. Ceased from sin is literally stopped. It's used in the New Testament when someone finished speaking. So they were talking, they're talking, they're talking, they stop. That's the Christian with sin. They used to be like the rest of the world, sinning continually, dominated by the power of sin, and then they stop. The text doesn't say that the man is sinless. 1 John 1, 1.8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But that 
what was once a practice of sin has stopped. The Christian doesn't willfully participate. Who in loyalty to Christ and in his power steadfastly endures persecution rather than practice wickedness with the rest of the pagan world. But through the suffering in the flesh for righteousness sake demonstrates that the pursuit of sin and the believer's life and the nourishment of the flesh that comes from that pursuit of sin has ended. Romans 6.11 Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God and Christ Jesus. They stopped sinning for a purpose. Verse 2 So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. The rest of the time is remaining besides. It's literally what's left over. That's what God desires. Whatever else you have. I used to get really sad when I came back to the Lord and I thought about all the wasted time I lost in my pursuit of the world as a prodigal. What I used the strength and the resources of my youth to pursue and how I had less time now to give to the Lord because I squandered it. But God, in his divine ways, he makes the quality of my remaining time great. He who has been forgiven much loves much. Consider the, the remaining time that the thief on the cross had, how much he had left over. God wanted it. He wanted all of it. He wanted all of him, whatever remained. He wants it. It's not that the time given to the Lord is of no value, but God is more concerned with the level of commitment. He would rather have a saint on fire for five years than lukewarm for 50. So whatever is brought to God, whatever time remains, he gets all of it. Full commitment. No longer for the lusts of men to desire, to crave, and long for what's forbidden. Men lust after pleasures and possessions of the world. Houses, lands, wealth, position, power, recognition, drink, sex, stimulation, recreation, and excitement. None of these things are are sin in themselves, but the act of lusting after them. If it's inappropriate, if something's forbidden, and to desire it and to crave it, no longer, but for the will of God. Lust is plural. Will of God is singular. God has a narrow path of righteousness and obedience. He desires us to pursue Satan says, pick anything else. Anything else will do but the will of God. Any number of the lusts of men, choose one. The will of God is what God wishes. It's what he desires. We know what God wants us to do. The Bible is full of instruction and commandments for the believer. Jesus told us our our two, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you're walking in the spirit, you will never break these commandments. It's the new covenant. It's so simple. Galatians 5.16 Walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. To live for the will of God is absolute. It is the only way a believer can live because he ceased from sin. The other him is dead. He's dead to sin. The only way he can live is in the obedience to the command of God. Psalm 119.56 
This has become mine, that I observe your precepts. Obedience is yours. Own it. Possess it. The believer is characterized by his obedience. His faith is witnessed by his conviction in what's unseen. The awareness of the presence of God with him, obeying the will of God before him. For a believer to chase fleshly lust, to commit adultery, would be to have Jesus lie down next to you. Those who sin, sin at night. In the dark, we walk in the light. Where can we flee from his presence? Where can man hide himself where God cannot see? The will of God is the only option. Martin Luther said, My conscience is held captive by the word of God, and to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. I'd like to close with a passage from Hebrews, if you all would turn there. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 32. But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence in which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in, every, for yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preservation of the soul. To shrink back and preserve the flesh is destruction of the soul. But when the righteous live by faith and the will of God and suffer destruction of the flesh, that's preservation of the soul. And then we get our new flesh. Don't hold on to this one. We got a new one coming. Amen? That's a good note to end on. We all stand. Father, thank you for providing us and being our salvation. Thank you for being our example. Thank you for not changing, for not being elusive to us, Lord, that we can grab hold of you, that we can open up your word and look at you whenever we please. Thank you for drawing us unto you, Lord. When we would rather wander, you call us out. Thank you, Father, for shepherding our souls, for being faithful with what we've com committed to you, God. We look forward to the day when we can praise you in the flesh. Lord, help us not to hold on what passes away, but be reaching forward to what's coming looking forward to what's ahead, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Help us to be likened more to the image of him this week. Help us to be more willing to die to self, Lord, to grow in the grace and favor of you, 
to be changed more and more to the image of Christ, God. That's what we long for. That's our heart's desire. We want to be more consistent and balanced and strong in the grace and the power of your might. Help us to be good witnesses to a dying world. Shine as lights. We love you. Thank you for redeeming us, for bringing us into new life, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We pray all this in your son's precious name. In Jesus' name, amen.